Hello, everyone, and welcome to Virtual Planetarium, the Sky Tonight part of our MOS at home programming. My name is Janine, my pronouns are she and her, and I'll be your moderator today. That means that I'll be reading some of your questions and responses, which you can submit below using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen here in the Zoom meeting. If you'd like to see captions during today's program, you can click the closed captions button at the bottom of your screen and select show subtitles. And if you're joining us on Facebook or YouTube, hello! Thank you so much for joining us today. Unfortunately, I'm unable to see anything that you comment um, over there. Um, we're so delighted to have all of you here today as our audience. Let's meet our guide who's going to tell us what's up in the sky. Thanks, Janine. Hi, everybody. My name is Katie. My pronouns are she and her, and I will be your educator today telling you all about what is up in the sky tonight. Um, our spin on this week's show is that we're going to be really diving into the how do we know a lot of uh, these pieces of astronomy. So we're going to be talking a lot about different spacecrafts uh, and how they've contributed a lot to what we currently know about astronomy. So I'm going to share my screen so that we can look at Stellarium. Um, that is the program I'll be using today. It is totally free and open source. If you're interested in downloading the software, you can go to Stellarium.org and download it there. We will have the link for you at the end of the show. Um, so right now we are set for about nine o'clock tonight and we're viewing from Boston. Uh, and this is a, a view of the southern southwestern part of the sky. So it's going to start getting darker a lot earlier now, especially with um, pushing the clocks back to tomorrow into Sunday, um, early Sunday morning. So at uh, 9 o'clock, it will be very, very dark. So you can definitely see a lot of stars and other objects in the sky as well, including planets. So the reason that I have this set for 9 o'clock is because there are two planets in particular that are very visible in in the southwestern part of the sky um, that once you go any later they set and so you can't really see them anymore for the rest of the night so go ahead and just make some observations about this part of the sky and uh, type what planets you think they might be into the chat or if you have no idea what they could possibly be you can just put a question mark Oh, so Elizabeth says maybe they see Mars and Jupiter, and Sylvie, who is 10, says maybe Mars. All right, good observation. So there are two planets low in the southwest, and then there's also one planet that's really high up in the southeastern part of the sky. Um, so these two planets here, this is Jupiter, and this is Saturn. Um, and then Mars, you can see it is visible it's all the way up here in the southeast. So we're going to visit each one of them, uh, starting with Jupiter. And I can put the planet labels on, too, to kind of help you out. And we'll just zoom in, get nice and close. Um, and as we get closer here, you can see a lot of Jupiter's moons are labeled as well. Jupiter has a whole bunch of moons. And the very first spacecraft to study Jupiter in depth. So a lot of spacecraft will fly by um, some of these outer gas giants, whereas uh, we have special missions where we send spacecraft to actually orbit around the planet. So the first spacecraft to orbit around Jupiter was the Galileo spacecraft. And this was uh, back in the early 90s. It was launched in 1990, arrived five years later because Jupiter is very far away. And if you want to send a spacecraft to stay in orbit around a planet, you actually have to make sure that it's not going too fast. Otherwise, it'll just kind of buzz right by the planet. So Jupiter, for reference, is about half a billion miles away from the sun. Um, it's, uh, I guess it's like nearly double uh, of what Mars's orbit would be, but it's very, very far away. And so it took a spacecraft uh, five years to actually get all the way out here and settle into orbit around Jupiter. Now the Galilean spacecraft taught us a lot about Jupiter itself and also the moons that are in orbit around it. So it looked into the composition of Jupiter, 
we know that it's made of hydrogen and helium and there's some ammonia. We know it's got lots of storms on its surface. And we also know a lot more about its moons. So there are four moons in particular around Jupiter. One of them is Io. And then we have Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto, which is all the way out here. So these moons you can see with a telescope, even just a backyard telescope, you can um, see them depending on your, I guess, your uh, individual perspective. Um, but each of these moons are really interesting worlds all on their own. And the Galileo spacecraft um, was named after Galileo Galilei, who discovered these moons around Jupiter. Um, and it told us a lot more about each of these individual moons. Like, for example, on Io, there's a lot of volcanic activity that um, contributes to the atmosphere of Jupiter. It kind of interacts with some of Jupiter's upper atmosphere. So uh, lots of volcanoes going on there. We also have Europa, which it was suspected to have a liquid subsurface ocean. And observations from the spacecraft Galileo uh, confirmed and supported the, this uh, hypothesis. So we think that under the icy surface of this moon, there are oceans of liquid water with more water than our entire planet, than all the water on Earth times two. Um, so that was a really exciting discovery. And uh, observations from the Galileo spacecraft also suggested that maybe that would be the case for Ganymede and Callisto, and that they might also have subsurface salt water oceans. Um, now, another spacecraft that was sent after the Galileo mission, a little bit closer to recent times, and it is still an ongoing mission, is the Juno mission. And Juno was launched, I believe, in 2011, and it arrived in 2016. So again, it takes five years for these spacecraft to get out there. And this spacecraft specifically went into orbit around Jupiter's poles, so it went to a, into a polar orbit. So it's observing a lot of um, the motion of gases around the poles. It's also looking at wind speeds, which includes storms on the surface of Jupiter, like the Great Red Spot. There are some really beautiful images that have come from the Juno spacecraft uh, about the or of the spot and. Um, also about Jupiter's magnetic field, because it's doing a lot of research into what the core of Jupiter is actually made of, whether it's a rocky core, or if it's more of a liquid metallic hydrogen core, which could be driving Jupiter's magnetic field. So a lot of what we know about Jupiter is owed to these two spacecraft in particular. So I'll pause there, Jean, have there been any questions so far? We have a couple stellar questions. So sure. Gabe, Annie, and Calvin are asking both, how big are stars and what are they made of? That's a good question. So stars are much, much bigger than planets. So even though Jupiter is the biggest planet in our solar system, the sun is still a lot bigger than Jupiter is. If you could open up Jupiter like a cookie jar and try to fill it with Earths, you could fit over 1,300 Earths inside of it. If you wanted to do that to the sun and open up the sun and fill it with Earths, you could fit over a million Earths inside of the sun. Um, so that's just a difference in comparison um, between a planet and stars, but our sun is a very average star, so it's not particularly huge as far as stars go. It's also not very small. Um, it's just right in the middle there. So there are stars that could fit, you know, hundreds of our suns into it, They're much, much bigger. Um, there are also stars that are a lot smaller, so there's a really big range, um, depending on what kind of star you're talking about. We have a related question from Kimberly, which is how big can a planet get and what is a planet made of? That is uh, a great question. And I realize I didn't say what stars are made of. So stars are made of really, really hot energetic gas. It's called plasma. Um, so it actually almost looks a little bit like a fluid if you've ever seen like a picture of the sun up close or a video of the sun. Um, planets can be made of 
many different things. So stars make their own light through a process called nuclear fusion. Planets don't actually have any kind of um, like energy source. So they don't make any light or anything like that. So they can be made up of a lot of different things. So Earth, for example, is made up of rock. Um, we've got all the rocky planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars, but there's a lot more to it than just rock, right? Um, there is atmosphere, there's liquid water. Um, so that's kind of mostly what would make up the Earth and also some of the other rocky planets, not so much the water. But then if you move on to the gas giants, uh, they are made almost entirely of gas and it's mostly hydrogen and helium gases. But we think that the core of a lot of these gas giants might actually be solid material. And there might also be oceans inside the atmosphere as well, which is kind of a weird thing to think about um, like liquid water or liquid ammonia um, inside of a gaseous planet. But astronomers think that that might be the case. All right, I think we can go on to your next stop on our, our journey today. Sounds good. So we're just going to hop right over to Saturn. Um, now, the first spacecraft to enter orbit around Saturn was called Cassini, and that was launched way back in the late 90s, and it started its orbit um, in, uh, around Saturn, excuse me, in 2004, and just ended its mission a few years ago in 2017. So. Uh, it was there for quite a while, and we learned a lot about Saturn, its ring system, also about its moons, like this one right over here is called Enceladus. This is another moon that we believe there is a liquid water ocean underneath the surface. Um, we've seen icy geysers coming out of the surface as well through these giant cracks. Um, that, you know, astronomers had no idea that there were any kind of places in the outer solar system that could potentially even look like the Earth or have things similar to the Earth, like liquid water. It's very, very cold out here. There's a lot of water ice, but it's hard to find liquid water, but it just turned out that we had to look under the surface of a lot of these moons. Um, so awesome discoveries about Enceladus. It also showed us that the rings are uh, not as old as we previously thought they were. So Saturn's ring system is composed of lots and lots of pieces of ice, um, probably from a moon that was made of ice that got too close to Saturn and it was torn apart and kind of shredded into lots and lots of pieces of ice. And so over time, they kind of settled into this ring system. And before the Cassini mission, astronomers thought that these rings had been there for billions of years, maybe even since Saturn formed four and a half billion years ago. But it turns out that Saturn's rings are much younger than we thought, uh, closer to 100 million years old which I know it sounds like a very long time, but compared to several billion years, that is like the recent past. Um, so learned a lot more about the ring system and how it's changing. It will eventually probably um, disintegrate or kind of fall into Saturn over time. So probably another hundred million years or so, Saturn will not have a ring system anymore. And one other really cool thing about the Cassini mission is that it brought along a friend, not a human friend, um, but a spacecraft that was meant to touch down on the surface of another one of Saturn's moons called Titan. And the spacecraft was called Huygens, and it was a lander. And uh, it landed on Titan, which was the first time that we had ever landed anything in the outer solar system, so out past Mars. So that was really exciting. And it was the first moon besides our own moon that we landed something on. So that was really exciting. And it discovered that it has uh, oceans and lakes and rivers of methane. So not liquid water, but liquid methane. It's got a whole methane cycle um, on its surface and in its atmosphere, which is pretty cool. All right, we will move on from Saturn. Uh, Janine, are there any questions about Saturn? 
We don't have questions about Saturn, but something I think we can tie into because we were talking about um, the orbiter, Cassini orbiter, and the rings that are going around Saturn and the moons and the those planets are all going around the sun. Well, Timothy wants to know, does the sun orbit anything? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so yes, it does. It doesn't really look like it's orbiting anything because the thing that it's orbiting is really, really far away. So we have our solar system, which is made up of the sun and eight planets, as well as an asteroid belt and something called the Kuiper belt, which is where Pluto lives, um, and a few other objects. But that's pretty much our solar system. And then, uh, so just the one star. And then our solar system is part of a galaxy. And the entire galaxy is made up of hundreds of billions of stars. So all of these stars are kind of orbiting the central region together. And right at the center of the galaxy, there is a super massive black hole, which I know sounds a little bit scary, but it's 26,000 light years away. So it's really far away, but it's so massive that it has an extremely strong force of gravity, which means that it affects a lot of the objects around it, even if they're really far away. So that's part of the reason um, that everything in the galaxy is kind of orbiting around the center is due to the supermassive black hole. There are some other elements at play as well, like a dark matter um, that is in our galaxy as well. But essentially, the sun is orbiting the center of the galaxy, along with all of the other stars that you can see in the nighttime sky. Thank you. And we do have a question from Tiffany that is Saturn specific, which is what are Saturn's rings made of? Yeah, Saturn's rings are made of water ice. So even though they look like they're solid, like you could walk all the way around them, they're actually chunks of ice. Um, some of them are as small as your hand and some of them are as big as a cruise ship. Um, but there are lots and lots of pieces of ice and some dust thrown in there too. All right, uh, so I wanted to briefly talk about Mars and one of the spacecraft that has shown us um, a lot of what Mars may have looked like in the past. So the InSight lander is a more recent spacecraft that was sent to Mars uh, just a couple of years ago now. And it's not a rover, so it's not one that um, travels around the surface and it's also not going to be in orbit or it isn't in orbit it's just on the surface kind of stuck in one place and it has a drill so it's going to drill into Mars and tell us a lot about the composition of Mars and so far it has detected a magnetic field it is also or, or remnants of a past magnetic field around Mars um, and it's also going to be looking for, is there any kind of seismic activity on Mars? So um, are there Mars quakes or things like that? Um, and that will tell us a lot about how rocky planets specifically formed um, and how they might evolve over time, specifically Mars and how the Mars environment has evolved. Because we think a long time ago, Mars was a lot like Earth. Um, we think that it had a thicker atmosphere and that it was warmer and even had liquid water on the surface. Mars has changed a lot since then, so InSight is going to hopefully um, tell us a lot about the Martian past. All right, so that's just some planetary science um, of our own planets, but we do have a few other spacecraft. We're kind of moving from close by to farther away. Uh, there are two more spacecraft that I wanna talk about that is related to planets, but not planets in our own solar system. So does anybody know the name of what we call a planet that doesn't orbit the sun? It orbits a different star. If you know what it is, you can type it into the chat and I'll give you a hint. It starts with the letter E. Got some uh, answers in here. Timothy says exoplanet, but I also like this uh, answer from Kimberly, which is outer planet. Ah, yes, both great answers. Um, outer planet is, that would fit 
um, it would, right? Because it would be outside of the solar system. Um, but we generally call them exoplanets, and that's because uh, it comes from extrasolar planets. So if you've heard the term extraterrestrial, that means not of the Earth. Extrasolar means not of the solar system. So and then that's a lot of syllables, so we just call them exoplanets. And so there are planets that are orbiting around other stars. And I can put up their location. So anywhere that you see a green dot, those are all stars around which we've detected exoplanets. So there are two spacecraft in particular that have done a lot of the legwork um, in in looking for exoplanets. They are the Kepler spacecraft and also the TESS uh, spacecraft, which stands for Transiting Exoplanet Satellite Survey, I believe. Um, so you can see that there are a lot in this one chunk of the sky, and that's because Kepler primarily looked in one very small section of the sky. And searching for exoplanets is actually pretty difficult because planets compared to their stars are very, very small. And we're looking at stars that are many, many light years away. So it's actually really hard to detect these exoplanets. So to date, we have discovered just over 4,000. The first one was discovered in the mid 1990s. So we've come a long way. And as our technologies get even better, um, we'll be finding many more exoplanets. There are plenty of candidates out there. They just have to get kind of the official confirmation. Um, so when we're looking for these exoplanets, you know, we're, we're trying to find places that either look really different from our own solar system or they look really similar and everything in between. Um, obviously, planets that are similar in size and composition to the Earth are always very exciting because you know, we always are looking for places where life as we know it could exist. Um, so we found planets that are similar in size to the Earth, that are made up of rock like the Earth is, and that are at a good distance from their star. That's called the habitable zone. But astronomy is not quite there yet when it comes to looking for atmospheres and looking for things on the surface. So things like liquid water and um, oxygen and nitrogen and the air that life as we know it means to live. Um, so those types of things are to come. But if you are ever interested in, um, you know, keeping up with exoplanet science, there are a lot of resources and ways that you can participate in it um, through citizen science. So if you're interested in that, give that a search after the show today. All right, Ginny, do we have any more questions? Oh my goodness, do we ever. Um, so we have two questions about Mars that are uh, related, which is why does Mars look a little black in that picture and um, what is Mars made of? All right, so let's zoom in again. And Mars is a rocky planet, so it is made mostly of rock and then its surface has a lot of um, dust and iron in the soil on the surface. And when the iron is exposed to the very, very thin atmosphere that Mars has, it oxidizes, which basically means it rusts. So the reason that Mars has its reddish color is because it's covered in rust. Now you'll see that there are some areas that are darker. Those particular areas just might not be as rusty as some of the other spots on Mars. It also means they might be a little bit like lower in elevation, um, like a valley as opposed to a mountain or something like that. But I think it's more to do with the amount of rust that's on the surface because this gash right here, this is a giant canyon that's five times as big and as deep as the Grand Canyon is. So it actually would stretch from the East Coast all the way to the West Coast of the United States if you were to compare the two. So the darker regions are just areas that have less, less rust. All right, um, and Janine, I think there was another question along with that. I think you answered both of them. It was about why the surface looked so dark in that one picture and what it's made of. Um, and so uh, elaborating on your statement about rust, um, somebody just wants you to elaborate a little more. Does that mean Mars is made of metal? I thought it was some kind of sand. Yeah, so 
the the rest um, that comes from iron, it's just iron that is part of the soil. So like on earth, we have iron in the core of the earth, um, particularly molten iron, and that's kind of what drives our magnetic field. But it's not just metals. Um, there are other types of rock as well. So Mars is kind of a similar deal where its core is solid. We think that it used to have a molten iron core back when it had a really strong magnetic field, um, but it has since cooled. So we think that like the interior of Mars is probably made up of a lot of solid iron and nickel. Um, and then it's also made up of a lot of rock and then there's metal in all of it um, kind of scattered throughout. So it's kind of a mix between both. Yeah, and it's interesting to think how metal, it looks different from like maybe a metal spoon that you have versus like metal that's in the sand on the beach or when you're walking around. And also astronomers are really funny about what they call metal. <laughs> that's a good point. <laughs> um, astronomers are pretty much say anything beyond helium is metal. So yeah. <laughs> we're, not, we're not chemists. Um, I'll leave with one question since we are at the end of time, but since tomorrow is Halloween, do you believe in extraterrestrial life, Katie? Ooh, that's a fun question. Um, so if you look at, I can't really say, you know, yes or no definitively. Um, well, actually, according to evidence, we don't have any evidence of life anywhere besides the earth. Um, but as far as I'm concerned, when you count up all of the galaxies in the universe and all of the stars within those galaxies, it seems like the probability is pretty good. Maybe somewhere out there, there is something. Um, it, there's just so many stars, so we can do the numbers really quick. So in our galaxy, we have hundreds of billions of stars just in our galaxy alone. And we estimate that there are the same number of planets as there are stars in galaxies. So there are also hundreds of billions of exoplanets in our own galaxy. And then galaxies in the whole visible universe, we think there are about two trillion. So the numbers get so high that it seems like there would have to be something out there somewhere. But like I mentioned, uh, we don't have any definitive proof of that. So we're always looking. Um, but I don't know, I kind of think that there's something somewhere out there. Uh, a galaxy far, far away. What well, do you think, Janine? I love that. Yeah, no, I think the odds of us ever like interacting with it are very low because as we've mentioned, space is really, 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 really big. Like it takes five years to get, what was that, to Saturn? To, yeah, to, to Jupiter. Yeah, to just Jupiter. to get there. Like just the amount of time and think about the time scale of our planet and how long we have had life that is technologically able to do anything cool. Um, it's, it's a very, very small on the time scale of the planet. Um, so being in the right time to connect with another something somewhere on some planet around some other star, perhaps in another galaxy far away. But I think the odds are kind of on the side of there being life somewhere else in the whole entire universe. And I think if there's not, it's kind of sad. It'd be pretty boring. <laughs> I agree. All right. Well, I'll leave that for all of you and I'll let Katie say goodbye. All right. Bye, everyone. Thanks for coming. Yes. Thank you all so much for joining us today. We hope that you enjoyed learning about how we know some of the things we know about space. Um, uh, if you'd like to see other programs that we offer, follow the museum on our social media channels, or you can check out www.mos.org slash MOS at home. If you are watching us on YouTube, you can actually subscribe to our channel, um, sign up for that little notification bell at the bottom, and then you won't miss any of our live streams for any of our programs. Um, and if you enjoyed today's presentation and would like to support more programming like this, please visit engage.mos.org slash welcome to support MOS at home. Uh, as Katie mentioned at the beginning of the show, this program was produced using Stellarium, which you can find at www.stellarium.org. Um, thank you all for participating. We hope you'll join us again soon. Have a very happy and safe Halloween. Goodbye.